Alright everybody, welcome into the Alley Oop. I'm your host Ryan Blackburn. A little bit of a different style video today. I am solo, not joined by a guest, and I wanted to try something slightly different on this channel. I'm going to rank the top 10 NBA contenders right now. I think that this is a good time to do it. Reason being is that we're a couple weeks before the trade deadline, where a lot of teams might look just a little bit different. But one of the reasons why I wanted to do this is you get to separate some of these teams into tiers. You get to be honest with some of these teams. And after talking to so many of these correspondents for the alley -oop, all of these folks that are close to their teams, I think I've got a pretty good impression, pretty good picture of who is good, who is great, and who has a real chance to win a championship right now. Which teams are in the driver's seat? Which teams are in need of some help, maybe at the trade deadline? And maybe which teams are too far away at this stage to really matter in the championship race. Some of these teams, a little bit closer than others, but we're going to go through it. We're going we're gonna to find out right now which of these teams have the best chance to win a championship, in my opinion, my opinion alone. Before we start, make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button on the channel. Would really, really appreciate it. It helps grow it tremendously. And if you like my content, if you want me to do more videos like this, just let me know. All right. Not ranked on this particular episode are the Golden State Warriors and the Los Angeles Lakers. I'm recording this on Sunday night. Last night, we got an epic matchup between those two teams. LeBron James, Anthony Davis, or and yeah, Anthony Davis was good, but not great. But it was really LeBron and Stephen Curry. Just a nice little throwback for those two guys showing what it takes to win at the highest levels of NBA competition. And yet it was between like two teams that are currently outside of the playoff picture. So I think it's unfair to rank those teams right now. Those guys, those guys are just too far away. Those teams are not good enough. And maybe that changes at the trade deadline. But right now it's, it's hard for me to really consider them in the top 10. They just have not been good enough at this point. With that being said, number 10, on my rankings are the Phoenix Suns, who are making a little bit of a run here. They've ran into a couple of unfortunate road losses with Devin Booker playing as well as he has. They've got plenty of offense. Might be a little bit too dependent on the mid-range at this point. I think if you look at any of the metrics, they probably abuse that a little bit too much. They probably use that a little bit too much, and that doesn't really help when your, your point guard is Devin Booker, shooting guard is Bradley Beal, and your primary scorer in other elements is Kevin Durant. Like, they can get into some of those sets and be just fine. And most of the time, they make good decisions. And I think that they'll probably be good enough on the offensive end. The question is the defensive end. Their defense is good, but it's a little bit of fool's gold to me. A lot of it is high effort right now. A lot of it is not necessarily schematic stuff. A lot of it is, hey, we're we're pretty smart veteran group. We know how to win. We understand. But there's just levels to this in the playoffs that they just don't have the guys physically that can really match up with some of the best teams in the NBA. And they're a little bit too reliant on Yusuf Nurkic, especially if you look at the data. So one of the solves for that is can Kevin Durant play the five? Can he slide over to the center position and be a primary rim protector? Can he do it at this age? Probably not. So I'm going to keep them at 10, despite the fact that maybe they add somebody at the trade deadline that could help. At number nine, the Miami Heat. They did just add somebody in Terry Rozier. That trade, not really paying immediate dividends right now, but again, this is about the playoffs. And it's funny, I just said, man, hard to really count out. Or you're counting out the Lakers, you're counting out the Warriors. Shouldn't you be counting out the Miami Heat too, Ryan? No, because we've seen this with the Heat before. We understand what this means, and we know what Jimmy Butler can do in the playoffs. We know what this team and Eric Spolstra can do in the playoffs. The Tyler Hero trade makes them more dangerous, but there are still some fit questions with him and Tyler Hero, in my opinion. Uh, did I say Terry Rozier? Yeah. Terry Rozier trade makes them more dangerous, but the Tyler Hero fit between those two guys, two guys that did not play for them last year when they made a championship run, is it's at least a little bit shaky. Do they have enough shooting? Do they have enough offense? Jaime Jaquez Jr. has been awesome for them as a rookie. It, is he going to just replicate what Tyler Hero did in the bubble? I don't know. Maybe. But it's going to be fascinating to see whether they have enough size, whether they have enough versatility, whether they have enough shooting. They probably do. And that's why they're on this list. 
But I just don't know if Jimmy Butler can keep getting away with this year after year after year. Being meh in the regular season, then being awesome in the playoffs. That dude is unbelievable. But I do think that that is probably going to come to an end at some point. We're not really sure when, but I am curious to see when it does come around. Number eight, the Minnesota Timberwolves, who are a great regular season team right now, the best defense in the NBA, but they're also fairly dependent on their scheme with Rudy Gobert. They've got some great positional defenders in Jada McDaniels, Anthony Edwards when he tries. They've got some guys like Nikhil Alexander-Walker coming off the bench who does a fantastic job. There are some holes there, though, and their offense just isn't really good enough. Right now, you've got to be a great offense in the NBA to win a championship. It has kind of flipped away from being great defense. Most of the time, you have to be able to execute in a half-court setting, and they just may not be able to do that. I'm curious to see whether they can. Anthony Edwards, can he match up with the best offensive creators in the NBA and be more effective than them? More effective than he was last year against the Nuggets in the first round? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see whether he can do that. And he seems like, I mean, if he is the next reincarnation of Michael Jordan, then maybe he can. But I do think that Anthony Edwards will be at the center of that all, as will Carl Anthony Towns, who I just don't trust. I don't trust him. He did just score 62 points in a loss to Charlotte. He's got to show me. The team around him has to show me that they can use him best, that they can use him well, that he can't be taken out by guys like Aaron Gordon or Jeff Green from the Nuggets last year, uh, the Houston Rockets prior to that, back in 2018. Like He's got to show that. He's got to show me. He's got to show a lot of people, I think. They have the best personnel, in my opinion to stop the Denver Nuggets defensively. Do they have the right personnel to stop everyone else, though, with as big as they are? Maybe they can. Maybe that's not as much of a question mark as it could be, but can I see this team stopping the LA Clippers? Not really. They've got too many isolation guys and too many quality options, and they're just going to isolate their bigs, and that's going to be a problem. So very curious to see how they handle it. Number seven. The New, or the, the New York Knicks, I was about to say the New Orleans Knicks. The New York Knicks, who I'm surprised that they're this high on this list. I could not believe that I put them this high. But OG Ananobi is such a great fit, an elite fit. And the roster just makes so much more sense now, now that they don't have R.J. Barrett. Because he and Julius Randle were taking up the same spaces on the floor. Neither of those guys was really willing to cede that. And when you get rid of R.J. and you... Take him out and you, you put in a guy who spaces the floor in OG Ananobi, who can cut off of that, who can riff off of that from what Julius Randle does, what Jalen Brunson does, and then just, just like an un unbelievable defensive player. It makes a lot of sense. And they're surprisingly good offensively with him too. I think I trust Jalen Brunson enough. I think I do. Will there be some matchups that he eventually struggles with? Absolutely. That's going to be a thing. And I think Knicks fans are going to have to be prepared for that. But I do think that they have enough, or at least they're very close. Julius Randle, it takes a little bit to, for me to kind of like realize it and understand it with him. He's got to play more efficient than he did last year, and he can't just shut it off. He's got to be better, he, and I think he will be, but I'm not sure I trust him to be perfect, which is why I have them here. They could benefit from adding the right sixth man, by the way. Emmanuel Cook quickly was great for them. He would be amazing on this team, but you got to give something to get something in OG and an OB. So maybe they could get somebody like a Jordan Clarkson at the trade deadline. That's a, that's a matchup that I'd be, I'd be looking out for for them. At six, the Oklahoma City Thunder. Every metric, every single one, says that OKC should be higher than this. SGA is already a killer. MVP candidate might be the MVP of the league, if we're being honest. He is so good. And he's also such a great defensive player, and it's so rare to have a, a superstar like that that can do it both ways. He's been awesome, but the entire team is so young. Their entire top seven of their rotation is in their age 25 season or younger. And as somebody that's covered the Denver Nuggets, I understand what it takes to go trial by fire with a young team. Denver had to go through that back in 2019. They advanced around but then they got to a tough game seven against a tough team and they got a little short with their shots. They got a little tight. They didn't necessarily handle it that great. You got to go through it. 
and OKC's got to go through it too. I think that that's probably what's going to happen, but every metric says that they are a true blue contender and should be way higher than this on the list, maybe even the top on the list. In my opinion, they need another body to face Nikola Jokic specifically, but then they also probably could upgrade over Josh Giddy. They are a classic team, in my opinion, that takes their lumps, that gets to the conference semifinals, maybe in a game seven, maybe then maybe they even get to a conference finals and they struggle there, but then they're immediately better for it. And they're better off the next season. Next year might be their year. I don't think it's this year. Number five, the Philadelphia 76ers. I think that they're a lead on both ends, at least in the regular season. They've got a nice mix of players. They've got an MVP candidate in Joel Embiid, a former uh, last year's MVP. They've got an all-star in Tyrese Maxey. I expect them to be named here soon. They've got elite role players around those guys. Tobias Harris, DeAnthony Melton's been out for a little bit, but Nicholas Batum's been great. They've got a lot of different guys. Kelly Oubre Jr. has been stepping up. Paul Reed is really, really good. Patrick Beverly stepping up when he needs to. They've got some guys that can really help them. Do they need another guy? Probably. I could see them using another scorer or creator, especially on the wing. Not sure if I trust Oubre to do that, but really it's not about that. Like, they're at five. Realistically, they should be top three as well. But the reality is that there's something psychological off with their group. They haven't made the conference finals yet, and I think it comes down to Joel Embiid. If he is going to be the player that he's been in the playoffs each of his each of the years of his career, they're just not going to be good enough. He hasn't shown up consistently, and he's got to be better. Like, I think he'd be the first to say that too. But I think that he's got to be better. He's got to show up more consistently. He's got to be at his best. Because what makes this team go is him drawing all of that attention and being great anyway. He's got to be great on both ends of the floor. And maybe this is a year that he does it. But he just sat out the game in Denver. He's still kind of doing the thing where he only operates when it's most advantageous to him. And I just don't believe in it quite yet. He's going to have to prove it, and you can't put the cart before the horse on this one. So if they get him to show up, and if they get somebody to be added at the deadline, like, uh, I don't know, Alec Burks or Bruce Brown or maybe even a Jordan Clarkson, then maybe this would look dumb. Maybe this ranking looks stupid at that point. But I'm, I guess I'm willing to take that chance because they have not been to the conference finals yet, and they're going to have to prove it to me before I put them any higher. At four, the Los Angeles Clippers. James Harden trade way better than expected for everybody. I knew that James Harden was still good. It was weird how he was talked about in the media. But the problem wasn't necessarily what he'd do in the regular season. The problem is what he does in the playoffs, whether he will show up, whether he will be his best self, or whether he'll kind of turtle up. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George are healthy right now. Things are looking great right now. Whether it continues, that remains to be seen. Still got plenty of time before the playoffs start in April, before things get really tight in May. I don't know if they're going to be healthy enough. I don't know if they're going to be able to survive. They might. They certainly might. They're probably the second most dangerous team in the Western Conference right now. They've got three dynamic scorers and creators and three centers on the roster that can challenge Nikola Jokic. Like, Ivisa Zubac has been great against Jokic especially this season. And then Daniel Tice, Mason Plumlee, those guys aren't great, but they're also bodies that you can throw at him and be physical. And Ty Lue is one of the best coaches in the NBA as a tactician. So they're going to get crazy. And they've got the pieces in order to do it. Do they have enough connective pieces? Terrence Mann, Russell Westbrook, Norman Powell, I don't know. Maybe they could use a physical forward type, somebody who they thought P.J. Tucker would be for them. But I do think that they've got enough otherwise. As long as those other guys show up, then they should be there. Like, they have a greater chance than just about anybody. They just have to show up. And maybe they'll be good enough. Maybe it will. At three, the Milwaukee Bucks. People will be confused about this ranking because 
they haven't proven it to this threshold in the regular season. But the playoffs are different. And this is the first ranking where I, I really feel that way. Giannis Antetokounmpo and Damian Lillard are immense competitors. They are crazy competitive. And they are also guys who show up when it matters. They're going to put their best foot forward. They are going to be very physical. Uh, they, and Dame, like he can make as many shots as anybody in the league from a tough shot making standpoint. That's what the playoffs are all about. And he doesn't need a lot of space. He's shown up in those moments before. He hasn't ever been on a team where it's really accentuated his strengths. And maybe this isn't the team either because they don't have enough perimeter defense right now. This is something that they could sign, uh, that they could really solve in the trade deadline. That's something that they might have to do. Do they have enough to guard Boston? Do they have enough to guard Tyrese Maxey and Jalen Brunson and Jimmy Butler? I don't know. But what I do know is that Doc Rivers will provide a little bit more stability for them, even if you can get the jokes off with the way that he handled Philly, but there's a lot of weird stuff going on in Philly, as I just mentioned. Are they good enough when it matters? If they're healthy, if Chris Middleton's healthy, if Brooke Lopez is healthy, if Giannis is healthy, if Dame's healthy, still got a top four that's just as good as anybody else's top four. And it's just going to be about showing up when it matters and being better than the team across from you. I think they could still do that. Like this 2021 is not that far away. It was three years ago and Dame is still very, very good too. So I wonder how it works. I think they need a trade. We'll see what happens, whether they can get that next perimeter defense guy. Number two, the Boston Celtics. Best regular season team by most metrics, top three offense, top three defense, you name it. The top six players in their rotation are awesome, versatile, dynamic, whatever you want to say. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, adding Drew Holiday was great. He hasn't been like amazing for them, but in the moments where you need him to show up, he will. I think he'll be just fine in those circumstances, and they are kind of slow playing it a little bit because they can't. Derek White's been great for them. Chris Tapps Porzingis has been great, although he's been injured. He's been a little bit shaky on the injury front. They could probably use some insurance there. If he is healthy, though, I don't see any team in the Eastern Conference being able to take them down because he provides such an interesting dynamic for them. Now, can he survive four playoff rounds? Can Al Horford survive four playoff rounds? What happens when they run into Embiid? What happens when I, they run into Giannis? Are they going to be able to be physical with those teams and then let's say if they run into the Denver Nuggets can they match up with Jokic we just saw how that matchup went I'm not sure they have an answer so it's going to be fascinating it's going to be very very interesting and I still do not trust them in clutch situations to make the right play but I do trust the talent and that usually wins out overall they are the most talented team in my opinion in the NBA they've got the best top six and those guys fit really well together. Can they get another body? Can they get some good production from a Peyton Pritchard or Luke Cornett or somebody of that ilk? I don't know. Sam Hauser, like, if he makes shots for them, then who knows? Maybe it's just their year. But I'm curious to see how it plays out. They should win. They should have been in the Eastern Conference. Uh, they should have been representing the East in the NBA Finals. They didn't because their guys struggled. We'll see if that happens again. And then number one, I've got the Denver Nuggets who won last year. They've been kind of sleepwalking through the regular season. But Nikola Jokic is still the most unstoppable playoff player. We know this. We've seen it. We understand it. No team in the NBA has done enough, in my opinion, to dissuade me from the fact that Jokic can score or assist on basically every possession in the playoffs. The only way, in my opinion, to stop Denver is to stop Jokic. It's to slow him down. He's, but I just think he's an unstoppable playoff guy. I don't think that there's any way to really do it. And if you overload on him too much, then Jamal Murray just showed that he can step up and be great when it matters too. And the rest of the starting lineup. That's the great thing about the Nuggets is that even when you overload on Jokic, they are balanced enough within their starting group to make it work. 
Now, KCP has been a little bit down from a shooting perspective. Aaron Gordon's not really shooting that well, and he's a little bit banged up. Michael Porter, still a little bit shaky at times, like in, in those clutch moments, not always making those shots. But he makes enough of them. I think the team makes enough of them that they're still a great team when it matters, and we've already had proof of concept with them. There are a couple chinks in the armor, especially with the bench, as I mentioned. They're still struggling to replace Bruce Brown, still struggling to replace Jeff Green. Christian Brown is fine. He's kind of taken a step back for them, but Peyton Watson stepped up. He's a rookie. They're basically a rookie, though. He's like 21 years old. Are you really going to trust that? Are you really going to trust Reggie Jackson? Is there anybody else on the bench you can go to? I think it's a fair question for them. They probably need to add something at the deadline, though I'm not sure what it is. But what I do trust from them is that when you play the starters as much as they will, they will execute the game plan better than anyone else. And their plan is also more inevitable, surrounding Jokic with the talent that's surrounding him, than anyone else can do. Both on the offensive end and surprisingly the defensive end. They can do it when it matters. And I haven't seen enough from any one team especially in the Western Conference, to really dissuade me from that reality. So I'm curious to see what happens, but let me know what your list is in the comment section below. Who are the main contenders in the NBA right now? And which teams did I miss on? Which teams do I most disagree with from your perspective? We'll see what happens. But hit that like button, hit that subscribe button down below. For everybody listening on the audio side, thank you so much. I'll talk to you guys soon.